project has been very, um, for me at least, has felt very cooperative or collegial because I really have needed the scientists. It's not something I could have sort of swatted up in a book. Um, so it's taken longer than it should have done, but it's out now and I'm very happy about it. And I'm particularly happy that R Rob's here tonight because actually the story that I wrote after him is about my favourite story in the book. Um, so that's just a bit of luck for me. Uh, I'm going to just read most of the story, I think, um, and then we'll talk about it. I'm very, very interested, if anyone else is, in talking about the process, of talking about what it was like to work with somebody who works out in a completely different discipline from you. It was really an interesting and great fun, sometimes, <laughs> process. So there's 14 different scientists, and obviously it was more fun with some than with others. <laughs> but the others aren't here, so that's <laughs> <laughs> um, The important thing to understand is that in every case, I tried to discipline myself to go to the scientists without a story. To go to the scientists just open to the ideas, open to what um, they might want to say, rather than a story which they would correct my many errors. Um, so all these, all these stories did genuinely emerge out of, yes, all of them I think, um, I probably cheated a bit, um, but in theory all of them emerged directly out of conversation. And this was the last one that I wrote, and it's called Dark Humour. When they finally got back to the cottage, the last of the light was vanishing, although there was still a smear of almost peach-coloured sky along the rim of the hills to the west. The wind had dropped, but the massed clouds which had soaked them earlier in the afternoon were being pushed away northwards, and above them was nothing but dark navy blue. If you bath first, she said, I light the fire, then you can start supper while I return while I return all my mud to its source. Don't use all the hot water. He gave the plan the briefest consideration. He slightly felt that he should offer her the bath first, but his own weariness, as well as his superior cooking skills, won out. He poured two glasses of whiskey, slots and water into hers, and left it on the table and carried his own undiluted up the stairs. When she heard the tap start running, she took a long mouthful of the golden liquid and turned her attention to the fireplace. There was kindling and even matches, but she could see that at some point in the evening they would need more logs. And now, while she was still dirty, seemed a better time to get them than then. So she went out to find the woodshed. In the few minutes they had been inside, the darkness had thickened, the blue sky turned back to black. The air was much colder, there were a few first stars sparkling brightly, and when she sniffed the sharp air, she could smell frost. She grinned to herself at the thought of all those H2O molecules huddling closer together as the temperature dropped, much as he and she were planning to do. Re re reconsolidating their relationship after her three months in Geneva. The logs were neatly stacked under a tile roof and a motion sensitive switch came on as she approached it. She gathered an armful, took them back in and efficiently set about lighting the fire. Afterwards she didn't bother to get up but stayed kneeling on the floor watching the flames transfer themselves from fire lighters to kindling and from kindling to the frayed edges of the logs. The damp from her trousers began to seep through into her thighs until she, felt cheer, until she felt chilled, and then her weariness hit. It had been a good, hard walk, leaving the car at Newbigan and taking a bus up towards Alston. As always, she'd left the logistics to him. He seemed to enjoy researching the com complex minutiae of rural transport, making possible what looked to her unmanageable. They had taken the high path south along the Holden Perth Band to Cow Green Reservoir, picked up the Pennine Way by the long cataract of the Cauldron Stout, and come down to the high force, then the low force, and so back to the car. It was, she realised, a long while since they'd walked so far together. She was allowed to be tired. 
When you came down today, your bath's running. She rose promptly and headed up the stairs. As she reached the turn, he called, I thought I might do the skate wings in a sort of tie broth. Is that good with you? Sounds wonderful. I won't make it too fiery. I could use some heat, and I put a bottle of bubbly in the fridge. I'll chuck in some potatoes then. Oh, very good, she said. They're certainly earthy enough. You're quick tonight. And they both laughed. After her bath, she put on leggings and an ancient faded red ultra-long t-shirt, comfort first, and her whole body suddenly felt comfortable. Glad to be here with him, glad to have been cold and wet, and now be warm and dry. But as she went down the stairs, she saw that he was sitting at the table with his laptop turned on. She was about to remonstrate, when he looked up, smiled very sweetly, and said, so tonight she's putting out the stars. <clears throat> she felt a slight blush and was about to dismiss the compliment with a self-deprecatory joke when she saw something in his expression and instead said, ho-hum, not funny, or not very. You're a crossword puzzle nerd, three, five, red shift, clever clogs. I said you were quick tonight, he said, but I've been out looking at them, the stars, and it does not bear thinking of not seeing any anymore. I was watching them accelerate away from us faster and faster, whatever the damn dark force is about. How will we be human? How will we stay humble if we can't see into deep space? They coped splendidly before 1600, she said, the Chinese, the Greeks, and the Arabs. There's stuff they could see that we won't. We'll still see everything in our galaxy, the Milky Way, everything in the solar system, all the planets and the moon. Surely that will be enough. Not for me. He looked so sad suddenly. She thought, as she often did, that although she was probably cleverer and certainly better at her job than he was, he loved it more, and that gave him an edge. She felt irritable with his sadness, his sentimentality and knew herself well enough to know that sometimes she begrudged him the joy he could connect with. To banish the little tug of envy and the rush of tenderness that somehow went with it, she put on a stern expression and said, and why do you have that thing on? I thought we agreed. Well, he said clearly, I'm ashamed. I could say I was looking up the recipe, but that would not be true. It's about the kitchen though. This kitchen is bizarrely over-equipped. There are too many bits and bobs and it's all a fidget and it's not elegant, it's too much. So, you can't have too many stars, but you can have too many gadgets. That's right, he said. So I was thinking about clutter and I went back to your bloody particles. How can we be calling all this fundamental? I mean, come on, six different kinds of quarks? Six? Seventeen different elementary particles? Never mind all the other crap. It's all an ugly, woolly mess. And there'll be more soon, the dark matter ones and so on, you know they will. I jolly well hope so, it is, after all, what I'm supposed to be looking for. You can't expect me not to want them to be there, the more the merrier. They'd been here before, he really did want a theory of everything, some sweepingly elegant simplicity. And anyway, they <coughs> are there, and if they are there, I can't just ignore them. No one's asking you to. I'm not asking you to. I just don't like it. There's something missing. I don't believe in it. But, yeah, I know, but. In the department, it's okay. It makes sense. It works. But it's the angels on the head of the pin again. Schoolman, taxonomies, here, out here, where it's cold and hard and real and the stars are dancing. I can't make it. I can't feel it's... He moved his hands away from the keyboard and banged them on the table in frustration. Beautiful, she asked. Oh, don't bloody start. He sounded angry, but she knew he wasn't. Just don't start on stupid metaphysics. We don't even know what to do with gravity, never mind aesthetics. She came down the rest of the steps and stood with her hand on the newel post, waiting. Eventually, he said, perhaps we need better names for them. What? Well, they're silly, aren't they? Tau neutrino. Three. Three W and Z bosons. Hadrons, kaons, baryons. They're gobbledygook words. They don't mean anything. Baryon does. 
It comes with the Greek for heavy. She felt a sort of exasperation, which she could only tackle by pouring them each another whiskey, even though as she did so, she could see just how much she had had already, just while she was in the bath. Her movement seemed to restore his benignity. He closed the screen of his laptop down, got up and went to the cooker. With his back to her, he said, I was reading, not just now, a while ago. I was reading about this woman up in Scotland somewhere. Liz Holden, she's called, and she has a strange sort of job. She invents or discovers or whatever good, meaningful story tale names for funky. The mycologist, Dave decided, at least they hope, that people will care more about them if they have names like flowers do. You know, forget-me-not and meadow-sweet and ladies smock. Not just Latin technical terms, stories. So perhaps that's what we need. He made himself busy over a pan. All the old stars had names and stories to go with the names. Gods and heroes and monsters and sort of linking, connecting with other stuff, other real stuff. But look now, look at H11 regions. Those wonderful, and yes they are, they're beautiful, damn it, wonderful, complex, fascinating things. These swirling, heaving clouds of ionized dust birthing new blue stars and do we call them Sibylle or Hathor or Pacamama? or any of the great mother goddesses. No, we do not. We call them H11 regions. We call them things like NGC 406. How can anyone love something called NGC 406? That's silly, she said crossly. You're not meant to love them. You'll be wanting to call them Virgin Marys next. I hope you're not planning some weird conversion number. Reversion to your family Catholicism, perhaps. She could hear the aggression in her voice and it faintly appalled her. She took a breath. This is physics, not poetry. We don't want metaphors. Why not? Metaphors carry meaning over, that's what the word means. We've lost it, you know. It's really exciting and expansive and bloody marvellous, but it's a mess. Good theory ought to make things simpler. Yes, damn it, lovelier, more beautiful. And this stuff just proliferates and uh, and we sort of have more and more intricacy without having anything to hold it together. No images and no stories either. But, no, wait, do you remember when they thought they found those faster than the speed of light neutrinos? Well, it took about a week and we were all happily theorising it. I did it, you did it, everyone did it. At a completely abstract level, we just explained it away so we could have our cake and eat it. And even public lectures on it. We simply let it get more complicated and more messy. Fancy proof of some new dimensions. And what was it? It was a bloody loose connection in an optical fibre. And that's not a metaphor, it's a parable. Oh, great. She made a conscious, willed effort to say pleasant, to keep the sarcasm as hidden as possible. And what do you plan to do about it? Ah, there's a question. Nothing, I expect. But... He turned his back towards her, and she could see he was grinning. Perhaps I should go back to magic. Perhaps I should become a wizard. Gandalf or something, Paracelsus. I could rather fancy the four elements. They're simple and pure enough. She tried to laugh too. Four elements, yes, of course, hence the potatoes. But it takes a long time to train as a wizard, if I remember rightly. And don't you have to be celibate? That's a snag, he said. But more generally, it works nicely. I can be a post-Einstein wizard. Look, earth, fire, air, water, gravity, strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force. Come again. Well, earth is gravity holding everything down. I should just quickly tell you that this next paragraph is a direct quote from Rob, um, which, I have sim which I've simply stolen and shoved into my story. You know? I even made him send it to me an email, so I spelled it right. <laughs> Earth is gravity holding everything down. Fire is the strong force, those quarks held together by the hot cauldron of exchanged gluons. Air is the weak force, somehow ethereal, like the neutrino it acts on. And water is the EM force flowing and swooshing around the electrically charged particles. Same theory, different language. Maybe better language. Suddenly, happily, she laughed too and recalled the sense of the air gathering its atoms together in the cold by the woodshed. Solids, plasmas, liquids, gas. I said you were a clever cloth. 
and then after a pause she added more slowly, holding her the cordon spout, high force, low force. When we were coming down this afternoon, I knew it reminded me of something, and I couldn't remember what. He laughed too, feeling generous, because he knew she had generously made an effort to join him. You can't have Holden Hearth just because it rhymes with Earth. Metaphors, yes, poetics, I think not. No, not. Hearth or Hurst. In the south, it usually means a copse or woodland. But up here, it means an earth bank or other elevated chunk of land. Rock, sand, or just earth. It's allowable. Just, he said. Just is enough, like the naughty neutrinos. You're right. Same theory, different language, better story. He transferred the skate wings deftly to two wide bowls, poured the poaching liquid over them, added some diced potatoes. She went over to the fridge, extracted the bottle of wine, and removed the foil. She came and sat down at the table, twisting the wires free and making happy little murmurs of appreciation. The fish smelled wonderful. Spooning down the spicy soup, she said quite playfully, sometimes theory leads observation, like the discovery of Neptune, and sometimes the other way round, observation first, like Levitt's uh, Cepheid variables. So I don't need an answer right now, but what's going to be the story about how the four elements mix in with each other because experiment does not reveal it? I mean, no, however much you mix water with earth, you don't get giraffes. I don't want to be contentious, he said, but however much you stir around your elementary particles or even your basic atoms, you don't get giraffes either. But actually, you've missed the point. The four elements theory was highly theoretical, although they probably didn't call it that, because it wasn't actual water, the kind that was pouring down those waterfalls or swilling about, flavoured up in your bowl. They were Platonists. It was pure or ideal water, or earth, or air, or fire. Theoretical elements, not the lowered sublunary kind we have down here. We're much more besmirched with materialism than Aristotle was. It wouldn't have occurred to them to put things in an accelerator and smash them back into their four separate parts. Idea and ideal went together for them. Or, oh, she said, deficient technology. How far in front of your technical capability can you imagine or speculate? Well, we're all speculating now, well out in front of our technology or even our data. That's why you need stories, images, metaphors to stimulate and integrate the imagination. Later, the carver finished, he made her a mug of herbal tea and poured himself another whiskey. She built up the fire and they sat on the couch, her legs tucked up under her as she leaned against his chest. The fire leapt and danced and they were peaceful for a little. Then he said, I'm sorry, I'm feeling really down about it all tonight. It must be an excess of the black bile. The what? The black bile. That's what I was looking up on the computer when you came down. And I never apologised for that either. It was bad of me. I'm sorry. That's enough apologies, she said. What's this black thing? Well, the four elements manifest themselves in the human body in what we call the four humours, which, oddly enough, is where the word humour, as in wit and laughter, comes from. When they're balanced, your health is good, but when they get out of sync, you get an appropriate illness and mood. So blood is air and it makes you sanguine. Phlegm is water and it makes you phlegmatic. Collar, or yellow bile, is fire and it makes you irritable or choleric. And black bile, in Latin, is melan collar. It's the earthy principle and guess what? Too much of it makes you melancholy or depressed. Is there anything you don't know? How to theorise gravity, why I find you so beautiful, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. I believe the answer to the last one is infinity. How do we treat it, your superfluity of black bile? Oh, come, come, he said, I'm a theoretical physicist, I can't know anything useful. <laughs> I think you have to introduce a fire element, cupping and spicy food and that sort of thing. Well, you should be in recovery then after that skate. So I should, but I'm not yet. There was a pause and then she said, you've been a bit down since I got home, haven't you? Did you miss me? 
That is such an unfair question. If I say no, you'll feel hurt. And if I say yes, you'll start thinking I resent your work. How about, I was having low thoughts about work and therefore brooding too much on the meaning of life and I didn't have you to laugh at me. I do not laugh at you. That's unfair too. Yes, it is. I've used up the apology ration, but honestly I meant I didn't have you to laugh at myself with. He fiddled with a strand of her hair. She waited. Okay, he said at last, I just don't think we're getting it right. And every time we hit a snag, we just make up some new things. Super string, super gravity, a few new dimensions, another bunch of particles. There's no consensus, there's only fashion, and it all gets more and more. Oh, you know what I mean. Membrane theories, multiverses for heaven's sake. I'm with Lee Smolin. There is only one universe. There are no others. Neither other universes nor copies of our universe within or outside exist. I want there to be a theory of everything and I want it to be as pure and beautiful as Aristotle's elements, not this hideous going all over the place, going nowhere, science fiction, fantasy world stuff. But she said, these things aren't fantasy. They postulated the Higgs boson. It took a long time to get the technology up to speed, rather literally, and there it was, just where it should be. Theory-led, or if you prefer, speculation-led discovery works. It delivers. Yes, he said. Yes, I know. And after a pause, she said, if you want stories, you ought to like the membrane universes. There they are, drifting about, and they bump into each other and generate a dear little baby universe. Gives a brand new, if slightly vulgar, relevance to the Big Bang. <laughs> Perhaps we could call them Casanova and Marta Hari or something, if that would make you feel better. Who's being a clever clogs now? But he smiled. Then he stopped smiling and said, look, I do believe there has to be a theory of everything. You know I do. It's different for you. You're a terrier. You get in there and worry away at things, and you're so bloody smart that it's genuinely useful. But I'm more like an old bloodhound, doggedly on a trail, and the scent's gone cold. And the honest truth is, which is what has caused the black bile attack, I'm realising, I have to accept, that I'm not clever enough even to imagine where to look for it. And that means I have to spend all my life doing stuff I don't believe in, um, don't believe is going anywhere, and don't think is right. I mean correct or true. Under her cheek, she felt him take a sharp breath, a sort of quiver, and then he said, so I'm going to quit. There was a moment of almost perfect stillness, and then a log shifted abruptly in the grate, throwing out a scattering of sparks. How would you feel if I did that? I mean, if I stopped doing research. I could go and teach school. I'd like that. She uncurled her legs and sat up abruptly, looking at the fire rather than at him. There was another longer pause, and then he said very quietly, or I could stay at home and look after our babies. She stood up, took a step away from the sofa, faced him and said somehow coldly, are you bloody drunk? She stood there for a moment or two, staring at him. He could see her eyes were filling with tears. And suddenly she turned away, snatched up her jacket, and went out of the door, slamming it hard behind her. It was sharply cold now, frosty and very clear. There was no moon, but the sky was bright with the stars one never saw in the city. The whole pale sweep of the Milky Way and the big W of Cassiopeia high to the north. Above the tide to the north, above the shadow ridge of the hills. She dashed the back of her hand across her eyes and pulled her jacket on and walked down the path to the gate. She stood there, shaken. After about five minutes, he came up behind her, put his arm round her, wrapping her into his own jacket and holding her against his chest. I'm sorry, he said. You're right. It was a bloody stupid thing to say. No, she said quietly, no, it wasn't stupid, it was shocking. I never thought of it before. My mother always said that if I went on doing all that fancy physics, no man would ever want me to have his babies, and I think I may have believed her. And I couldn't give it up, you know. I know. 
So I just never thought about them, and I didn't know you did. Quite a lot, actually, which is probably why I'm not such a good physicist as you. But I don't need them. I don't want to pressure you. They stood in silence, both looking up at the vast vacuity of space. There's Orion's belt, he said eventually, swiveling her around gently, so she was facing in the right direction to see the clear line of three stars. He was a giant and a god of hunting. That's why you only see him in winter, in the hunting season. And if you look behind him, right over there, you can see Scorpio chasing him. Orion foolishly boasted that no animal was strong enough to kill him. So the gods sent a little scorpion to sting him to death. Hasn't caught him yet. On a night like this, it does seem nearly unbearable that they're all whizzing away from us faster and faster. I was starting again, I'd try and do dark energy, I think. So fascinating. But you probably don't want that, a fifth force. As a matter of fact, he said, Aristotle introduced a fifth element. It was called ether. He didn't think the stars could be made of the same stuff as things on Earth. They had to be made of something more beautiful, more unchanging, even more absolutely pure and ideal. So my new theory, or rather my adoption of the old one, can keep up with yours. We can match dark energy to ether, the quintessence, the fifth element. I think, she said quietly, that you would make an excellent science teacher. You know lots of stuff and you tell great stories. After a short silence and with what felt to him like something adventurous or courageous, she added even more quietly, Barely whisper and an excellent father. Later, inside, warm again, she said, What are you going to do with the quintessence thing when it comes to bodies, black bile and phlegm and all that? He ran his hand under her red t shirt and said jovially, It has to be something pure and beautiful, sex perhaps. Pure, she said, very ideal. Then, very softly, he added, Or love? Even later in bed, she broke the long hush of shared delight and murmured, hmm, they say good sex is difficult, but it seems to me it's a damn sight easier than particle physics. Dark energy, he says, and brings into the dark. More is unknown than known. Is sex a property of space itself, a fault line in the st standard model theory of gravity, a new dynamic force, an ancient metaphor, or a pure abstraction. This needs further experimentation. We need more data and better data before we can speculate. <laughs> Aristotle, 
who added a fifth one. And this kind of echoes our modern particle physics worldview that everything's made of fundamental things that are somehow glued together. And it's pretty amazing that as a civilization, it's probably our greatest achievement that we've understood at a, some kind of basic level what everything, the trees, the sun, the stars, this lovely perspex chair that we, uh, that we sit on is, is made of. Um, so we had lots of conversations as we were doing this, doing this story. And I'll tell you about the forces in a second, what the things made of. There are 17 fundamental articles, fundamental building blocks. And it's pretty amazing how they all fit together. But so Sarah asked me, so there's four fundamental forces, she said, and there are four fundamental humors. We have a correspondence between the two. And I thought, oh no, this is kind of a, an author's question. It's not a scientific question, I'm scared of this. But actually, when we had the conversation, it pretty quickly emerged. There was a very obvious, in my head, way of linking the old Greek fundamental four things to our modern fundamental four things. And it was very natural. And so it just, it just emerged in my, my physics soul that these things should work in a certain way. So what we have, just a, a couple of minutes, just so you have some background to our view of the world, you think everything is made of particles, indivisible little dots. And this may or may not be true. It's worked pretty well up until now. You may have heard things called string theory, for example, which is a replacement to this theory. Uh, which are things of 11 dimensional vibrating superstrings. <laughs> but at the moment, we think particles work pretty well. And if we, and we stir in some pretty interesting theories like Einstein's theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, we just stir these things into the mix. And then this tells us how, if particles exist, how they move. So we look at nature and we see particles exist the quarks and the electrons and the, the, the neutrinos that Sarah talked about. And then once we have, have these particles there, we do a very amazing thing. We simply ask these particles to have a certain symmetry, it's called. So symmetry is a thing we all know. If you take a triangle and rotate it by um, a third of the way around a circle, you get the triangle again. So uh, this triangle is always in, invariant in physics, we love inventing words, is the same if I have a certain operation on it. So I ask my particles to be the same under certain operations. And if we do this, all the forces of nature, the weak force, the strong force, they all, all emerge very naturally. So our universe appears to be symmetrical. And we don't know why that is, but it seems to work very well. So we talked about names. And we have also, I think, physicists, we've come up with some good names along the way. The quarks, for example, uh, were named in the 60s by a guy called Murray Gell-Mann from Finnegan's Wake. Because quarks don't like to be alone and isolated in nature. They like to be built up of more complicated particles. For example, you take three quarks, glue them together, and you make a proton that you have inside an atom. So there's a quote from Finnegan's way for three quarks for Mr. Mark. So, Murray Gellman, that's a great name for my particles that appear to all exist in groups of three. So we call them an axillary reference. And these things sit inside of protons, and they move around inside of protons, and they glue together by a force-carrying particle called the gluon. So we invent these lovely names for these things. And our scientific narrative, the scientific side, is what protons are made of. They're made of quarks, and they're glued together. So the actors in our little game are the quarks and the gluons, and the names are telling us something about what they're doing. They're glued together inside the, inside the proton. So it's, it's, I think, as my career has gone on, I, I paid no attention to names, I think. But a part of our job as physicists is to tell stories, to communicate our science. So what we name things and how we describe things, I think, is very important. So the actors that we have are the quarks and the gluons and the neutrinos and other such things. And you all have lovely things associated with it. I think what we really understand about the universe now is nothing, absolutely nothing, <laughs> so, which is true for several reasons. You can talk about um, we ask questions if you want. Um, but we f first of all know that our theory of the universe is incomplete. If we weigh the universe, everything I've just talked about is a mere 4% of the weight of the universe. All the rest, we have no idea what's going on. So we know something is somehow incomplete. I think it's a very important thing to understand. That we, 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 uh, you said, they don't know anything. I do. We as physicists really do know nothing about it. We want to be very humble about that. And it's always great fun talking to people about when they try to understand how much do we know. Do we know everything? And, uh, no, actually, we know absolutely nothing. I think it's quite a hard process for anyone um, to kind of grasp if somebody turns up in your office and says, 
tell me what you do, and you say, what do you want to know? And I said, the whole point is that I don't tell you what I want to know. <laughs> That's not a very good kind of conversation opener, really. Um, so the people who work best with the people who are very flexible, people who loved what they were doing. Um, which actually most scientists do, don't you? It's very strange. They need some rapport as well. So these things yeah. merge through conversation. So if you can talk to somebody, and you feel relaxed with somebody, you have a long, wide-ranging conversation. Did and something emerges organically from that. Did yeah. you feel a bit nervous? Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. About how yeah. you really represent. Did you read the story and think, oh, yeah. Me? I, felt, I felt nervous because it, it felt outside of scientist's comfort zone. Creative people. We're not known as... And we are in a different kind of creativity. We're not literally creative. In terms of writing creative stories down. So the conversation we're having about the formation yeah. of narrative, I... So now I'm not used to it at all as a scientist. How, how much are you... I want to say something with Rob. It was a much longer process than with some people. I mean, we had, what, had three or four conversations oh, yeah. and you really kind of wrestled in with the text because I find it very, very difficult. I'm not quite pleased with the story now, but it was difficult. It was difficult to find a way because it got very big. I mean, a very big subject matter. <laughs> I'll get it down to 3,000 words. Hard work. 